Well, the West Side Church of Christ, where we're several Christians studying God's Word, so we can live God's Word. I want to welcome everybody for being here. If you're a guest, man, you guys are really special. You know, you mean a lot to this place. You fill out a guest card, leave it on the queue, or drop it in the basket on your way out today. I want to take a, take a second and, and say welcome to our friends from Home Mission. Home Mission is going to be using this message part of their evangelistic outreach and one of their upcoming workshops. So, to our, our song leader today, when I ask for upbeat evangelistic songs, mission accomplished, and you guys sounded great. This message this morning, I'm going to ask you guys to get involved in it. I'm going to ask you guys to get involved in it. So I, if I ask some questions, I, I, I'd like you guys to get involved. I'll repeat whatever you guys have to say within reason. Uh, so it, it, it's got on the recording. Does anybody ever suffer from fear? Does anybody ever suffer from any type of fear in their life? What kind, what kind of things do you suffer from fear on? Death. Failure. Failure, okay. Suffer from failure. What? Death. Death. Okay, fear of death. Anything else? Failure. Death. Unknown. What's that? Unknown. Ongoing fear. Well, that's good, but unknown. Unknowing. Oh, unknown. unknown. Fear of the unknown. Okay, there we go. Yes, sir. I didn't hear you. Kangaroos. Uh, okay, we'll say a fear of kangaroos. Hey, that's specific. There's nothing wrong with that. With me, it's snakes. I don't like no kind of snake. I like is a dead snake. So I'm right with you there, sir. Yes, sir. The fear of fear itself. The fear of fear itself. You know what? There's a really good quote that we'll come across today that talks about that. So, you know, fear. And I've been given the, the, the topic of overcoming fear. Well, okay, overcoming the fear of evangelism. But as I, as, I, as I thought about this topic, as I prayed about this topic, and I was only given this topic on Monday of this week, and, uh, you know, I had fear that came upon me, because you guys all know that I, I plan, I pray, I study, I adjust my messages, you know, over several weeks. You know, so getting told on Monday that I need to do something presented on 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 Sunday, I had some angst, I had a little bit of fear and stuff about it, and I went forward and it was called the fear of evangelism. And I felt like as I as I prayed about this and everything, I think the best way to do it is we need to talk about fear itself first. There is good fear and there's bad fear, and we're, and we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about that. You know, I don't know if anybody else equates fear with the fear of evangelism, sharing the good news with people. It, it does with me at times, and, and, I'll, and I'll talk some more about that here in a little bit. You know, so this morning there's a few things I want to touch on. I want to touch on, I want to talk about, I want to talk about the evangelism. First, I think you guys have said evangelism, what is it and who's responsible for it? And then evangelism. What are some of the stumbling blocks when it comes to evangelism? And we'll, we'll talk about that. And then, how can we overcome the fears associated with evangelism? So maybe I better first give ourselves a, 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 a definition, a definition of fear. Definition of fear according to Oxford, by, uh, Oxford Dictionary, in a noun form, in a noun form, it's an unpleasant emotion. An unpleasant emotion that is, that is caused by a belief that someone or something is dangerous. For me, spiders, and somebody else says kangaroos, fear of the unknown, and all the other ones. And, they, and it's likely to cause pain or a threat. In the verb form, in the verb form, it says it is to be, to be afraid of something or someone. It's likely to be, the person would be dangerous, painful, or threatening. Now, I mentioned that fear is both good fear and bad fear, and I'm just giving you bad fear, but the best way for us to talk about good fear is to look at what the scripture says about Good fear, biblical fear. And if you have an outline with you today, and, and if, you're watch, if you're watching online, you can go to our Faith Life site and download an outline at www.faithlife.com, W-S-C-O-C hyphen I. You know, and you can download an outline. There'll be some lights on the outline. So some good biblical fear is fear of the Lord. 
Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of uh, wisdom, is the beginning of knowledge. In Psalm 111, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his, who do his commands. His praise endures forever. So right off the bat, Right off the bat, as we, as we look at this, we see that there's a healthy fear that's seen in the, seen in the scripture, and I can't stop with that, and I've got to give you some more. Because we're sent to Christians studying God's word so that we can live it. So I need to give you God's word. You know, like Nick had mentioned about the message, the message you know, that, that I would deliver. It's not my message, it's God's message. I don't care if you ever remember me, I want you to remember Jesus. And I don't want you to remember what God's word says. You know, so the next thing is the fear, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of it. That one may avoid the snares of it. And add to that, so we've got we got the fear, the fear of the Lord is beginning knowledge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Then we get the, the eye of the Lord. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Psalm 33, verse number 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. On those, and look at this next word, who hope. Whose hope are those who hope for his loving kindness. We should be a, a hopeful people when we know the fear of the Lord. When we know the fear of the Lord. That we should be a, a hopeful people. You know, and going, going on just that much more, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, and we, we've talked about the beginning of the knowledge, the fountain of life, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, and it, and it ends with that one, with loving kindness. Here's another one that draws in loving kindness. In Psalm 103, in verse number 17. It says, but the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to the children's children. So the biblical examples are contrary to what Oxford, Oxford Dictionary says, the worldly definition. Because with the, with the biblical definition comes wisdom, comes knowledge, comes understanding that we can apply, that we can clearly define to the scripture as something that is possible. It's the beginning of knowledge, it's a fountain of it's a fountain of life, it's the eye of the Lord is on those who love, I mean who, who fear him. And it's the loving kindness of the Lord for those who fear him. So now as I mentioned, we we're addressing the fear of evangelism. The fear of evangelism. So let's talk about evangelism for just a minute. Evangelism and the evangelist. You know, for those of you that have my card, you know that, 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 that I am the, the minister evangelist of Westside Church of Christ. You know, and, and my title, you know, part of my job is that I am to be the evangelist. I am the one to deliver the good news. But let me ask this, let me ask a few questions. I need you guys' involvement. You know, the first, the first question, the first question that we'll put up here is, what is evangelism? What do you think, what does it mean? I kind of gave it away somewhat here a minute ago. But evangelism, what does it mean? Spreading the word. Spreading the word. Any word or specific word? His word. Spreading his word. Spreading his word. Okay. Anybody, anybody else want to add to that? Sure. Evangelism, what does it mean? Sharing his love. Sharing his love. Sharing his word, sharing his love. His words can just absolutely explain the point and share his love also. So now the next question I want to ask is who is responsible for it. Who do you think is responsible for evangelism? Okay, I see somebody pointing at themselves. Oh, oh okay, somebody is saying, okay, is, okay, I have a few people that are showing their hands and not saying anything, but you guys trust me online that they're, they're saying everybody's involved. I mean, everybody's supposed to be involved in evangelism. Everybody's supposed to be involved in evangelism. So now we're talking about, we talked about a couple things and what it is, and who's responsible for it, but now let's go and define it. That's defined. Evangelism defined in the noun form, it's the spreading of the Christian gospel by public speaking, by public preaching, or personal witness. Again, that is turning to the Oxford Dictionary. 
it's, it's described, and we've talked about that already, it's sharing the word. Sharing, you know, maybe it's sharing what the Lord has done. Sharing what the Lord has done. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 4, it says, in that, in that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people, make them remember that his name is to be exalted. Is there anybody here that can't do that? Anybody here that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't say, man, look at what God has done in my life? What the Lord has done in my life? I, you know, I was, you know, with me, you guys know, you guys know my testimony, I was a drug addict, I was an alcoholic, but God rescued me out of that. Suffered from many other things, but God rescued me out of that. I didn't do anything, God did it all. He met me right where I was at and rescued me. You may not be a witness of Jesus Christ, and none of us, I, I'm looking around the room, there's nobody that's over 2,000 years old. So none of us have actually witnessed Jesus Christ, but we can witness the power of Christ that does the changes within us. And when I say that, that we, we can also then, we can point, you know, that evangelism is about pointing to the source of salvation. Pointing to the source of salvation. Again, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament again just for a minute. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. In case you guys ever wonder, Isaiah is like the fifth gospel. And it's kind of hidden, in the, it's hidden back in the Old Testament, but man, it's a very evangelistic uh, it's a very evangelistic message. Isaiah chapter 45, verse number 22. It says, Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Then look, and then if we cut back over now into the, into the New Testament, the church has been born, and not, and not, too, much, and not too much longer after the church was born, Paul is, I mean, uh, Peter is going to deliver the second evangelistic message. And in de delivering the second uh, evangelistic message, he says, he says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven and earth that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Isaiah pointed forward, You have Peter that is pointing backwards, saying that there's no other way. Must be saved. That, that means that there must be a need for salvation. There must be a need for salvation. So how do you come to the next one? The next thing when it comes to it comes to evangelism, it's, it's, it's telling about the need of salvation. Telling about the need of salvation. Isaiah, turning back to Isaiah the fifth gospel, one more time, turning back to Isaiah chapter 59, verse number 2. It says, but your iniquities, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Flip back over to the New Testament. Now Paul, talking to the church at Ephesus, says this. And that Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10 is probably, you know, it's an evangelist dream passage. But it starts off in, in, in verse number 1 and it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. You know, when we turn back a little bit, a few years before Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, and we turn back to the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, Peter, along with the other apostles, stood up and gave the first gospel message. And we get to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 40. After historically speaking and proving through history who Jesus Christ was, that he was a long awaited Messiah. Uh, we get to this very place and Peter says this. And, we, and Luke records this. He says, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this, from this perverse generation. So do you guys think that this is applicable for today? Do you guys think that this is applicable today? Do you think we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation today? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
a little bit. I don't think we have to look very far. You turn on the television. You open the newspaper. You walk out your door almost these days. And you can see it. You know, the, and then, so we're talking about evangelists. Now I want to talk about the evangelists. Let me talk about the evangelists for just a minute. The evangelists described and the evangelists defined. Or I should say defined and described. Evangelist, it's a, it's, a, it's a noun and it means a person and especially a preacher who tries to convince people to become Christians. Someone who talks with great enthusiasm. Paul describes it like this. In, Roman, in Romans chapter 1, he says this. I am under obligation. I am under obligation both to create sin to the barbarians, both to the, to the wise and to the foolish, so that for my part, I am eager. I am eager to preach the gospel to you, to also to those who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and into the Greek. He felt that so much had been given to him, that he had been forgiven so much, that he was obligated to be an evangelist, to evangelize, to share the good news. You know, in Luke chapter 12, in verse 48 and following, it said, you know, in verse number 48, Jesus talked about to, to those who have been given much, much is expected from them. Is there anybody here that's been given much? And forgiven much by Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're talking about the evangelist still. So, how do the evangelist, the office, the title of an evangelist, come to be? Ephesians chapter 4 says this. And he made some as apostles and some as and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the, of the saints, for the works of, of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So you can notice here, if you, if you look at verse number 12, the reason for the evangelist was to equip the saints for the works of service. And so the equipping of the saints for the works of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. For the building up of the body of Christ. If you can see that the evangelists, without a doubt, are responsible for evangelism to bring home the good news. The need for salvation, the means of salvation, the results of salvation. So who else is involved for evangelism? And you guys all said we all are. So the believers. The next one is the believers. The disciples of Jesus Christ. The disciples of Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't know these verses. You probably do. Matthew chapter 28. Jesus, you know, before his ascension, is, and after his resurrection, is talking with his apostles. He's talking with his apostles with some of his final direction before the ascension. And he says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He says, Go therefore. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. He goes on and says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, Jesus, talking to his apostles, tells them what they're to do, and they're to go out, preaching the gospel, and as they're going, they are to make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's the same thing as saying in Jesus' name and teaching them to follow the commands. That means that as an evangelist, I deliver good news. You then are responsible for the good news so that you can go out and share the good news. So that you can go out and share the good news. You know, uh, another verse, another verse maybe you're familiar with is Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Oh, I know you know Mark 6, you know, 15, 16. But let's look at just at, at, at verse 15. It says, and he said, it, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news, the means of salvation, the reason for salvation, how God has impacted your life, pointing to 
you the way of salvation in Christ Jesus. And he says, go preach the gospel to all creation. The command that it was given was the gospel. The good news was to be preached to all, and it was to be, it was to be accompanied by the disciples, not just the apostles. It's to be by the disciples, not just the evangelists. It's for everyone, everywhere, in every place, in every time. You know, even before the Great Commission, even before the Great Commission, you know, it was for others. Any of you guys will remember, there's a story that, that Jesus tells about, you know, it's recorded that uh, Jesus when he's at the well. And he's thirsty and he meets a Gentile woman at the well. And he shares, he shares with this Gentile woman who has some questions and she goes to him saying, oh, you're a Jew, what are you doing you talking to a Gentile woman? And after, after, after he start, continues to interact with this woman and everything like this, this woman figures out who he is. And he tells her, I am who you, I am him. And look at how it, how it is. It says, the woman left the water pot and, and went to the city and said to the man, come, see a man. Come see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They, were, they went out of the city and they were coming to him. She knew who it was. She knew who it was and she was so excited. She, she left the water pot. She was going there to fill her water pot. And she left the water pot behind to go share the good news. Guys, come check it out. Check it out. This sinful woman who had been married for five times and is living with living with another man that is not her husband. And it comes in, to meet Jesus. And her builds a relationship with him that forever changed her life. It's, a, it's exampled by the it's exampled by the disciples. And I'm going to be very specific. I'm going to talk, use the word disciples, not apostles here. You know, after the birth of the church, persecutions happened. A lot of people, well, a lot of people that became Christians, they were previously Jews, they're put out of the synagogues, they're, they're, you know, their livelihoods are taken away because Jews would not deal with Gentiles, you know, and they would consider them as dogs. They considered them less. They would not allow them to buy. They wouldn't allow them to sell. There could be all sorts of problems. There was persecution going on even by, by somebody by the name of Saul that became Paul the Apostle, who with letters went chasing after them to drag them back to Jerusalem, to drag them to prison. Through the persecution came a scattering. Acts chapter 8, verse number 4. This is right after Paul had been continuing to persecute the church with murderous rage. After the death of Stephen, he says, therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So the disciples all went out and were scattered to share the good news. Some of the times that the church grows the most is when there's persecution or there's bad things that are going on. I'm sure you guys can remember back to 9-11. Churches swelled with people at that time. People needed hope. People still need hope today. People need the hope that is in you today. You know, a couple more little points that I want to make on this. The apostles' command was to make the most of your time. Make the most of your time. And be, be prepared to share the hope that is in you. Colossians chapter 4 says this. Speaking of making the most of your time. It says, conduct yourselves with wisdom. Wisdom towards outsiders. Making the most of, of the opportunity. Let your speech, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. So that you will know how you should respond to each person. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> After talking about 
persecution and suffering for good that he talks about in chapter 2 and coming into this section, coming into chapter 3, because he says, but sanctify him. But sanctify him. Christ is Lord in your hearts, always being ready, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks. You to give an account for the hope that is in you. And then he tells them how to do it. Yet with gentleness, reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. You know, we've talked about fear, we've talked about evangelism, we've defined evangelism, we've defined who's responsible for evangelism, we've, defined, we've talked about the command for evangelism, but there's, now I want, I want to talk about the stumbling blocks. The stumbling blocks. So I need you guys to get involved here. I've got, I've got a question for you, it's not on the screen. When you, what are your thoughts when it comes to evangelism? What would be a stumbling block? What would be a stumbling block that would keep you hinder you or shy you away from evangelizing? Feeling like you're not adequate in the word. Feeling that you're not adequate in the word. Okay, thank you very much. What else? What else? Why else? Anybody? Being too shy. Being, being too shy. That's a good one. That, thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, the way people will react to The way people react. Oh, man, you guys are I've got to come around to that, you know, I should be paying each one of you because these are going to come right to the points that we're going to talk about right now. So here, anybody else real quick before I, I move on? What people say back to you. I didn't, I'm sorry, I still couldn't hear you. What people say back to you. What people may say back to you. So here's some of, some, some of the stuff in the blocks that is, uh, I was preparing for this message that it, it, you know, some very common ones. It's not my job. That's why we have him. It's James' job. Let him do it. You know, it's his, it's his job. You know, that's why we have an evangelist. That's why we have a preacher. That's why we have a minister. I don't need to do it. I'm not very, com I'm not very comfortable with it. I'm not very comfortable with it. Another one, another one is, I'm just not well versed. I'm just not well versed. I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not equipped to do it. And the fear of being rejected or what somebody might say, what somebody might say, or you know what, I don't know about you guys, I, I always get worried about, I might say something wrong. What happens if I say something wrong and I lead somebody astray? I don't, want to, I don't want to do that. Did you know that Moses had a fear of evangelism? Moses had a fear. Moses! The great prophet who sat at God's feet, who was handed the tablets, who led the people out, had fear of evangelism. Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 1. Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 1 says, Then Moses said, What if they do not believe me or, or listen to what I say? For, for they may say, oh, The Lord has not appeared to you. You know? And he's not the only one. There's a gentleman in the New Testament. There's a gentleman by the name of Ananias in the New Testament. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and says, Hey, man, you, got, you need to go and you need to find Saul. And you need to, you need to find Saul. And he was a little worried about it. And that's what he said. He said, ben, But Ananias answered, Lord, I, I have heard from many about this man, how, how much harm he, he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Can I be honest with you guys? Evangelism can be a scary thing. You know, Jesus, when he sent the apostles out to go evangelize, he sent them out two by two. You know, what's kind of interesting is when I, when I was in college and, and I was, um, had to do a door knocking campaign. You know, door knocking a thing from yesteryear that still could be effective today. We were, we were doing uh, door knocking and the friend of Tabitha's and mine was, was out with me as we were doing door knocking in Idaho, Texas. 
Get on with it. We had the cops call on us. And a little old lady, little old Baptist lady was there, you know. Because we're talking to her, asking if there's anything that we could pray for her about, and, you know, and, and asking her, why, why do you attend the church that you attend? And we're talking to her, and uh, the police pulled up. And you know what the lady had to say? She goes, they're telling me about Jesus. They're telling me about Jesus. I mean, I was, I'm going, okay, but well, we breaking the law? They're going to take us to jail? What's going on? But you know what? We kept sharing with her, you know, we, and, and, you know out, of, out of that town, I mean, we prayed with a lot of people and everything. But it was a scary thing because I was worried about what somebody might say. But we had lots of doors that were slammed in our face. We had, we had somebody of, of, of a different religion. There was not a, a Christian religion that said, I know more about the Bible than you don't ever know and get off my property. You know, so still, we got to preach Jesus. We've got to share Jesus. We have to share how he's impacted our lives. You know, sometimes it's hard talking to strangers. It's hard talking to strangers. You know, I have a, a, a friend of mine that, you know, every single time, and I can't say I do this every single time, but every single time that you were to go out to dinner or out to lunch, he would stop the waiter, the waitress, whatever it was, and say, we're getting ready to pray. Is there anything that we can pray for you? And he would also give him a card and invite him to church. Man, what a great idea. You know, what a great idea. I, I, wish I, I, I wish I had the courage to do that sometimes. But you know what? I, I suffer from the fear of evangelism sometimes. i got to be honest about it. You know, my friend Gary has gone home to be with the Lord. He's received his reward. He's, he's heard that well done, good and faithful servant. You know, I'm very blessed with I've ever known the man. So let's talk about overcoming the fear of evangelism. You know, in a little while ago, you know, our, young man, our young man mentioned that there, you know, fear of fear itself. And that came, that came from that came from FDR. That came from FDR. He says the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And in, in him giving the address, he's, he is giving this as an encouragement. As an encouragement. So now my next question is, how do you face fear? How do you face fear? I think we all can admit that we have fear. Kangaroos. Snakes. You know. How do you face fear? Prayer. Prayer. Okay. Absolutely. You know, because you have faith, you pray. Yes, sir. I was going to say faith in the armor of God. Faith in the armor of God. Absolutely. All right. How else can you how else can you face fear? Acknowledge what it is and study on it. Learn it. Okay, so acknowledge what it is and learn from it. Is that basically what you're saying? Well, like if you have a, a fear that you don't know enough about the word, then equip yourself. Ah, okay, so you, now you're going to bring it into word if you have a fear of not knowing enough of the word, not equipped to do it, then immerse yourself in the word so that you are equipped. Yes, sir? Understand you're not alone. Understand that you're not alone. Oh, man, that's a big one. That's a, that's a really big one. Anybody have anything else? I don't leave anybody out if anybody has anything. <coughs> you know? Be willing to face your fear. Be diligent to face your fear. So let's talk about overcoming fear. I thought there was kind of a cute picture that's up there. You know, overcoming fear. I know that, you know, we're looking at overcoming the fear of evangelism. I think the best way is to, to look at fear itself. Coming again from the scripture. Don't fear. Don't fear. For I am your God. And according to Isaiah 41, 10, it says, I will uphold you. Like you did in the scripture, it says, do not, do not fear, for I am with you. Do, do not anxiously look around about you, for I am your Lord. I am your God. I will strengthen you. And surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my Righteous right hand. Some say victorious right hand. You're, you ever think you're going to let God down? Let me tell you something. You were never holding God up. God holds us up. 
with his righteous, with his victorious right hand. You know? So the next the next thing, in overcoming the fears of evangelism, and in, in overcoming fear in general, is to cast your fears, cast your anxieties on him. For he cares for you. He will uphold you with his victorious, with his, with his righteous right arm, because he cares for you. First Peter chapter 5, verse number 7 says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. And, and another way to overcome fear is to know that perfect love and God of his love casts out fear. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. And verse, uh, verse number 18 says, Therefore there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ Jesus, love is being perfected in you. Because God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to come and live and die for you. He took on your sins because he loves you. Not because he had to, but because he chose to. You know, when we talk about overcoming fear, and the fear of evangelism, now I want to turn to the fear of evangelism, it, it's, it's let God's work, let God do the work in you. You know, God's, you need to put God's word in you. You need to put, be strong. You need to be courageous, as it, as it says in Joshua chapter 1, in verse number 9. He says, have I not commanded you? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and, and, and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So if it's in a pew, if it's in a restaurant, if it's in your home, if it's in your neighborhood, if it's at your job, God is with you. So be strong and be courageous. So, to sum up this part here real quick, when it comes to fear, know God. Know that God upholds you. Know that God cares for you. Know that, know that, that, that God's love casts out all fear. So be strong and, and, and be courageous. For the Lord your God is with you in and through all things. So, the next thing that we can do in overcoming the fear of evangelism is to put God's word in you. To put God's word in you. And let it work in you and let it work through you. Colossians chapter 3. So let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in, in your hearts to God. This goes hand in hand with evangelism. It goes hand in hand with evangelism. And when you put God's word, when you put true wisdom, when you put knowledge in, then we will know something like it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse number 3. And it said, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. It has to do with true knowledge, knowledge that comes from above, true knowledge that comes from, from the wisdom that comes from above. It brings about the fear of the Lord that dwells in us and that reverence, that awe that we have for God so that we can face our fear and face the fear of evangelism. The best way to face fear is to be ready to share the hope that is in you. And our hope has a name according to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 1. And his name is Jesus. And from that hope, we can share the good news. We can bring somebody else to have the same hope that is in you. And I don't know about you guys. I get worried about rejection. And as an evangelist, I get more rejection. I get more rejection then I get people that respond to the gospel. But you know what? Hey, if you get rejected, you're in good company because they rejected Jesus. They rejected the apostles. So you're in, and they, reject, they rejected the prophets. So you're in good company. You know? So press on. Press on towards the call, the upward call of Christ. 
Listen to, another, way, another thing you can overcome the fear is to listen to evangelistic messages, sermons, teachings, read literature. Read literature that can help you to be more comfortable in your knowledge so that you're able to evangelize. And as one person said earlier today, remember we're not alone. Remember that we're not alone. And we're not just talking about each other. We're talking about God's Word in you, God's Spirit in you, God's Spirit working through you, so God's Word will come through you. You know, to bring about the good news to others, so that we, together, can fulfill the Great Commission and share the good news, going into all the world and making, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, baptizing them in the name of Jesus, and then teaching him to follow the commands, knowing that, lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. So while overcoming the fear of evangelism truly does come knowing, having, embracing the fear of the Lord. But overcoming the fear of evangelism is overcome when we have and embrace the fear of the, uh, the Lord, knowing who he is. He's God Almighty who created all things, who knew all things, who knew that man was going to rebel, that man was going to, to sin against him, and that he was going to sin. You see, God purpose to purpose and plan to plan and scheme to scheme. Before the world was ever created, he knew that he was going to have to send Jesus. That man was going to rebel against him in the garden. And from that point forward, there was an enmity between man and God. And Jesus Christ came to live and to die to close that gap so that we would be reconciled to the Holy God. So that we would be reconciled to the Holy God. We need to know who he is. We need to know what he's done. We also need to know what he's promised. He's promised to those who love him and are called according to his purpose that he'll work out all things for the good. We need to know that those who, who, who know him, who have fear of him, who know why he sent Jesus and why Jesus went to the cross, that he's promised to come back. Then one day he's coming back to judge the world. Or actually to execute the judgment. The judgment's already been made. The world's been found lacking. According to John chapter 3. You know? Overcoming Overcoming the fear when it comes to evangelism starts personal with overcoming the fear. We need to first overcome sin. Well, you overcome sin by, by knowing that you're a sinner and need of a savior. You take your sin and you're going to you're going to nail it. After you hear the good news. The good news that God loves you, that he sent his only begotten son to die for your sin. You overcome, you overcome sin with the nail of belief. I believe. I believe who God is. I believe who Jesus is. It's God's only begotten son. I believe. Just as the scripture said that on the third day he was going to rise again and that he rose again and that he's going to come back again. I believe. I believe he has all power. I believe that he has all authority. I believe that there's salvation in no other name except in the name of Jesus. We overcome, we overcome sin by con confessing Jesus. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. What do you need to confess? Is he talking about confessing your sin? No, it's confessing that you're a sinner and confessing that he's the way. He is the way of salvation. That he is a way of salvation. That we need to confess him as both Lord and Savior. Overcome sin by repenting. Knowing that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, turning from you trying to, to save yourself or to try to do good, think, oh, I'm good enough. Because according to the scripture in Romans chapter 3, there's none good, no, not one. There's none that seek God. So that means none of us can get there on our own. We need Jesus. So it's, it's turning from our way, our works, to the works of Jesus. We overcome sin by being baptized through the remission of sins. 
calling on the name of Jesus, knowing that our sins are washed away, taken as far as the east is from the west, knowing that, that our sins no longer will have hold on us, and that we're born again, as Jesus said, of water and spirit, and we're given the, the Holy Spirit, the promise that washes us, that regenerates us in the Holy Spirit power, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that raises you from the dead when you were baptized for the remission of sins. And then we go to learn the commands, to live obediently, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, preparing to share the good news with others, to share the hope that is in you because you know that you've been forgiven. If we have anybody here today that has not responded to the gospel message, who has not had their sins washed away in the waters of baptism, and they believe, they've confessed, they've repented, and they want the liberty, they want the freedom that, that Jesus Christ offers. We offer that opportunity now as we stand and as we sing.